Grace and peace be unto you, children of God, from our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. You know, I always thank God on your behalf for his grace, and, 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 and I just do it for all things, that you're enriched by him so you won't be lacking in any gift. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Master Class. As I've told you so many times, these classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God, and I'm going to take you from the beginning, as we have been, to your eternal beginning, in depth in God's Word, revealing His plan and purpose for your life, into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it, how to operate in it as God designed you to. You don't want to miss any of these classes, my friends. However, if you can't make it to the virtual uh, classroom here on the broadcast, then know that these are archived for your convenience. God bless you richly as we study. Let's begin. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts flowing through our lips, and we exalt and praise you in your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your word, and, and we know that they're hungry for your will. We praise you for um, our Lord and our Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. And we thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, your logos word, the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear today, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. My friends, did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. You need to elevate your expectation level and you'll come away with greater uh, revelation and a greater heart and mind connection. <clears throat> now, today we're going to talk to you about, we're still talking about the love of God. And we're going to talk about the Father, heart of God. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39 says this, What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes. Who was raised from the dead? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, no thing present, nor things to come, nor powers, or height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now notice here that the Bible says that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. <clears throat> now we speak about <clears throat> agape God, uh, love or agape love. And this love that God has for us is the love we understand to be unconditional. The word unconditional means that it's not limited to conditions or limited by conditions. Most of human love is conditional, my friends. We say to each other, I'll love you, but you must or as long as you, then we attach the condition. <laughs> <laughs> to our love, okay? And when we attach little conditions to the giving of our love, it makes our love conditional. This is, in fact, uh, not agape love because love is a gift. It is, uh, it's no longer a gift when, when you attach a condition to it, right? What do I mean? Well, you attach conditions, it becomes an exchange. You do something, you give me something, and then I'll give you my love. It's no longer the free gift of love that the Bible talks about. We never gave God anything. We have never deserved anything either. Romans 5 verse 8 says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is the love that is unconditional, and it's a love that is a gift. And we have to rise above our level to God's level, love, level of love, which is unconditional. So a love that is unconditional says, I give you the gift of my love. I do not attach conditions to it. I don't ask that you be good. Uh, I don't ask that you be deserving. I don't ask that you exchange something back for my love. Sometimes parental love for children is manipulative. That means that we tell our children that if you're good, I'll love you. If you're bad, I won't love you. Then as we grow up, we have a preconceived idea that that's the way God is too. That's the love of God. And God never said that. 
God loves us whether we are bad, whether we are good. Uh, the only difference is that when we are in disobedience, <laughs> well, we're not. When we're in disobedience, we're we're not in the position then to receive the full measure of His love. You see. But even though man may go to hell, the Father heart of God beats with the love for him. It's not in his plan. It's not his intention for them to suffer in any way. His love never ceases. His love never stops. And so that kind of love, that parental love that is shown to children, is manipulative love. In other words, we manipulate them with our love. And sometimes a husband and a wife use that form of love also, but that's not God's agape love. That is human affection human love. And Jesus says that we have to love one another with his kind of love or uh, and not with our kind of love. See, the truth of the the truth of the um the matter actually is that we should tell our children that we love you no matter what you do, no matter who you are. However, we would like you to behave this way. <laughs> no matter though, whatever you do, my love for you never ceases. That's what we should cultivate with our children. Then actually live up to it. Make sure we follow through with that. I'm sorry, I didn't take the speaker off my telephone and, and I forgot, so we had to have that interruption. And now I can't even get it to do cooperate so that I can <laughs> I can shut it off there. Okay. I got the rid of the speaker so we don't have to listen to that. Alright, so we need to follow through with it what with with that way of loving. That's called unconditional love. Now here in the United States they did, actually did a survey of all the most heinous crimes in prison. I mean, not crimes, but criminals that are in prison. And they found that 80% of them in their childhood had never received unconditional love. And they had never had a happy home filled with love. Children need to know that we love them, not for what they do, not for what they are, but simply because we love them. That is the love that God wants to bring forth in the family in a relationship between a man and a wife. In a relationship... <clears throat> between Christian brethren. <clears throat> That's the kind of love that we need to have. So you see, agape love says, I'll give you the gift of my love without demanding anything from you. Also, it says you can be who you are and what you are without fear that I'll ever stop uh, judge you or stop loving you. See, if it's, if it's the love that's unconditional, there'll never come a time when it will stop. But if it is a love that is rife with conditions, then there will come a time when it will stop or it will change. It will be love that says, I love you, but. <clears throat> now, when we begin to love one another with God's kind of love, we love each other unconditionally. <clears throat> For example, I could come to one of you and say, I love you with the love of the Lord. What am I saying here? Well, I'm saying that that means I love this person with unconditional love. That means that if I love uh, Mary Jane Smith with unconditional love, she can do what she likes. She can say what she wants. She can pour out all her good feelings and her bad feelings. She can pour out all that is hot in her he head and all that is cold in her. She can pour out all her best and she can pour out all her worst without any fear that I will ever judge or reject her. That is unconditional love. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we love with unconditional love, we are actually saying, I will never ever think badly of you, judge you, or your actions, and most of all, never, never reject you. Think about mankind. <clears throat> most of us have received rejection almost daily in some amount. I've experienced rejection before, and so have all of you. What's happening is that mankind is still governed by conditional love, but when we have a glimpse of God's kind of love, it's unconditional, and God never ever rejects us. Look in the Old Testament. One of the worst things, one of the worst kings was Ahab. <clears throat> Another of the worst was Manasseh. It, <clears throat> I'm sorry. It tells us he did everything that he was, that he did, and it was wicked. It made God very angry. And the Bible says that when he got, when he said, God, I'm sorry, immediately God loved him and God forgave him. Ahab didn't de did terrible things. I'm telling you, he did horrible things. He started Baal worship in Israel. He made God angry. And then there was one time that there was a teeny hint of repentance in his life. It was after he had acquired N N Naboth's uh, vineyard. Elijah came to him and rebuked him and said, Thus says the Lord. Ahab went back and put on sackcloth and he wept. And God said he would not mete out the punishment in his time. What I want you to understand here is this. 
I want you to understand the heart of God. He's called the He's called the God who is ever forgiving. I'm sure if Adam and Eve had just come and said, "Hey, we're sorry," instead of putting the blame on each other, they would have been forgiven. <clears throat> they feared God, which we know means that they were in awe of Him and reverenced Him, and they feared rejection. They feared that God would reject them. I mean, let's be real. He was the only source they had. <laughs> they were they were afraid that with each other, we would that we fear being rejected. Yet God says, I will love you with an everlasting love. And the love that God has for us surpasses all our human comp comprehension of love. You see, the Bible uh, tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 that Paul was still praying for them that they might know and comprehend that love of God. The width, the length, the depth, the height of God's love. That's a tremendous love, my friends. It never, ever rejects. King David knew this. He knew God's heart. He knew what God God's heart was like. And when he fell into sin in numbering the Israelites, God sent the prophet Nathan and said, Choose from these, these three judgments. The judgment that we experience is the reciprocal of the kingdom principle laws that have been set in God's heavenly kingdom. From where we come as citizens to this earth, David had, had a choice. He had a choice to be chased by his enemies and experience famine, yet he said, I choose to fall into the hand of God because he is a merciful God. Now that's a smart guy. I don't want to be pursued by my enemies. I would rather, if anyone were to give me a spanking, let God give it to me. That's what he was saying. And I don't want my enemies to spank me. If there is anyone who I want to discipline me, it's God because he is the most kind and forgiving person in the universe and the most merciful. And true enough, God's mercy and love reached out. When the angel drew the sword against Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that God's heart reached out. His heart of love said enough. You see, every time God spanked them, he felt the pain. That is the heart of God. Now, I'd like to, for each of you, of your hearts to beat with the heartbeat of God and to understand his unconditional love. You know, when I began to study the love of God and began to understand more about the love of God, I actually began to realize how limited human love is. All of us go through times and experiences when we place conditions on our love to others. Every time you come to a place where you reject another person, it only shows that your love for them has been conditional all along. True agape love never, ever rejects. Now, a person can criticize all they want, and you are to be like Jesus with unconditional love. And so you say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. Okay? Look at Jesus. His unconditional love was pouring out through his being. They could crucify him. They could beat him. They would spit on him, and, and, and they, they could put his, pull his beard out. And he still said, I love you. What kind of love is that? It's the love that when people reject him, he still says, um, even though you reject me, I will not reject you. I still love you. So <clears throat> let's look at some scriptures on the love of God. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 15, it says, um, um, well, I want you to turn there in your Bibles if, you're, if you've got your Bibles with you. You know, people sometimes have a misunderstanding of the Old Testament. What they don't understand is that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the same Father whose heart <clears throat> beats, still beats with a heart of love is, is the same Father that's in the New Testament. Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. This is the Old Testament, God speaking. And Isaiah lived in the time of Hezekiah, who saw the destruction of Israel. The period of Hezekiah was interesting. Hezekiah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And Isaiah lived at the time um, to see the destruction of the northern kingdom. Jeremiah the prophet was up there. Raise your hand upward. See? Like I am. <laughs> Isaiah the prophet was down here. Lower your other hand downward. Point down. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> Isaiah was was up there, all right? Jeremiah the prophet was up there, up high. And down below, Isaiah was down below. And both of them spoke of God's love, even though the judgment came because of what they did. They reaped what they had sown. <clears throat> now God says, I will never forgive you, forget you. I will never forget you. And he was not talking to a lovable lot. He was talking to the utmost despicable, unlovable, ungrateful group of rascals who were idol-worshipping all over Israel. 
They set their idols on high places on every hill. And God said in love, as, I, as a promise, I will not forget you. This unconditional love was flowing forth from the Father heart of God. Now, Jeremiah in the North Kingdom, up there, <laughs> said this. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Paul never had a New Testament to read. The only Bible Paul had was the Old Testament. Now, personally, I can't, I can't say this was true, but I do believe that he received 1 Corinthians 13 beside the revelation from the Spirit of God in his meditation of the Old Testament scriptures. Because this is where Paul probably got the verse where he says love never fails. In other words, love never ends. Love never comes to a point where it stops and says, I will not love you anymore. So what is rejection then? Well, rejection is actually saying, I've come to a point where I will not love you. But the love of God never ever comes to that point, friends. The love of God always says, I will always love you. And God, at this time, through Jeremiah, showed up. Right? Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, who was known for crying out of the love of God for the Israelites. Jeremiah said, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I can still trust in his love. See, we reap what we sow, but I can trust in his love that he will never cast us off. Then further down, he goes on. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Which is why I say that you can disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. One of the favorite things that religious people do is argue doctrine. What they're doing is heatedly discussing methods of operation, operation in Christendom. But in the midst of their discussion, they come to the point where they say, I will never love you, I can't, I reject you. You see, we must never do that. We must always realize that God's unconditional love says that even if your doctrine disagrees with mine, I still love you. Even if your methods of worship and delivering the word of God disagrees with me and mine, I still can love you. See, the unity that we have in Christ Jesus can only come when all of us understand unconditional love. Unless the church of God and the kingdom of God on this planet Earth is built on unconditional love, we will never see the unity of the Spirit of God. It will only come by unconditional agape love of God. That's the way it comes. And God said in Deuteronomy 7, He told the Israelites that I have chosen you. I have loved you because I love you, not because this one or that one was strong, not because this one or that one was mighty, not because of who you are. He told them that, the ver that very clearly in Deuteronomy 7. In the Hebrew word for love, when God said, I love you, is the word hasid, hased. Um which means, I am kind to you. I desire just to love you and do the best for you. Love's offered in degrees, actually. Three stages. The first stage of love is kindness. Kindness says that I love you and I care about you and I'm on your side. The opposite of rejection is, I am with you. I stand with you. And all this time, the devil has been tricking man into thinking that God's against us. Today, Satan is still working in the minds of Christians. We always think that God's against us. At the back of our mind, we fear him. We fear we will, he'll reject us. Why? Because that's what we would do. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, at the back of our minds, he's working on us. Then Jesus came and died for us, and now we're able to realize that God says through Jesus, in what Jesus did, I am on your side. Even though I am the judge of the universe, I don't want to see you condemned. So, he sent his son. Now, you can plainly see that God is on your side. <laughs> okay? That's why Paul received the revelation. When he said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Are you with me? All right. Well, um, let's bring it a little closer to home. Bring it to the relationship of our love for each other. We're constantly telling people, you're not on my side. How? With our body language and the spoken word in the way we put things. But if we love each other with the love of God, we will say with all of our being and body language and nuances, I am on your side. Say that. I'm on your side. You know, denominations fight. They fight what they're saying, and what they're saying is, you're not on my side because you don't believe the way I do. Or, see it the same way as I do. What kind of love are Christians showing to each other? Shame on us if we put conditions on our love. The Bible says that love says, I'm on your side. Remember what I said on the earlier series? I said, love seeks the highest good in a person. 
I am on your side. I seek the best for you. Everyone in the world needs to hear that. There are so many people out there on the streets today that think that God's a great judge up there in the sky who is against them with a big fat club, seeking to punish them, seeking to judge them, just trying to trip them up and catch them in a, in a sin. <laughs> they don't know the heart of God. And that they don't know that God's on their side. They don't realize that God loves them and cares for them. Now here's where we begin to see the heartbeat of God. In the book of Luke, chapter 15, in the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal son was not doing what his earthly father wanted. The prodigal son chose to go his own way, and the prodigal uh, spent all his inheritance and wasted it, didn't he? He did everything he could to hurt his father. Now, let me tell you that everything that is wrong on this earth hurts the heavenly father. When the prodigal's father had to give the inheritance to the prodigal son, I can tell you the father's heart was bleeding. It hurts. Some people think that when judgment's measured out to us, that God doesn't hurt. He hurts more than we do. All of you who are parents realize this, that when you have to discipline your child, it hurts you as much as it hurts the kid. It hurts. It's a different kind of hurt, but it hurts. And that's why in Genesis 6, before the flood came, God revealed in his word that he was grieved. It says, and God was grieved. You know what grief is? It's the same word as sorrow. God is sorrowful. He feels sad. Imagine the great creator of the universe and galaxy feeling sad because a bunch of, of uh, uh, little tiny human beings down here, no bigger than ants from his perspective, didn't obey his laws. God has feelings, friends. Remember that we are made in the image and the likeness of God. He's like us and we're like him. So when the judgment came, not only did he, the cries of humanity go off like rockets, many of them may have uh, continued to cry as they died. The heart of our father cried louder than them all. He cried when the judgment came. Why? He was grieved. Now, when Jesus was on the cross, you can't tell me the father doesn't have feelings. Jesus felt the pain of the sin for us, of sins for us. He took the pain of sin and death for us. Jesus felt it. Now, even though our heavenly father didn't come down to earth like Jesus did, our father up in heaven felt the pain and the anguish as well. It was so bad that the word tells us that for a moment he had to turn his eyes away. That's when Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Your father, our father experienced pain and anguish and suffering when the judgment was poured out. Okay, getting back to the prodigal son. <laughs> One day the prodigal son came back to the Bible. Came back, the Bible says. I'm sorry, it didn't come back to the Bible. The Bible says it came back. In Luke uh, 15, verse ch chapter 15, verse 20. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father has been searching for his son. All this time he's been searching for his son. That's why when the son was far off, the father was able to see him. He had been watching for him every day. And he'd been looking in that direction all the time, waiting, hoping for his return. See, the Bible says he was full of compassion. And he had so much love that before his son could get to him, he ran to the son and hugged the son and kissed him. He brought the son home, ordered the fatted calf to be slaughtered, had a party, ate and made merry. He was rejoicing because his son had come back. Now notice now the other son. Look at what the other son does. Luke 15, 25. Now this elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. All right, look at that attitude of the older brother. He saw all these things happening, the music, the dancing, the fatted calf killed, and, he, and the merrymaking, and he refused to go in. And when the father came out, take a look at verse 28. I want you to see what the father did to him. His father came out and entreated him. The father didn't just ask him to go in. He pleaded with him. The father said, come on, son, please go in. He pleaded. Now look at the reasoning of the elder son in verse 29. But he answered his father, lo, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you gave, never gave me a kid, a goat, that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your living with harlots, you killed him, or you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, uh, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. So what happened? Well, first the father cleared up his son's misconception. <clears throat> the father said, You can have as many parties as you want to. And the older son says, Hey, he didn't, but 
I keep all your commandments. All right. The older son kept the commandments, the rules of the house, so to speak. But what do we do? What, what do we see here? He followed the rules. He served his father well, but he didn't know the heart of his father. He didn't know that the father loved him enough that he could have had whatever he wanted. He didn't understand unconditional love. His understanding of the father was still rooted in conditional love. Can you see it? All right. Well, I'm out of time. <laughs> so we'll pick it up here next time. And I am so sorry. Uh, I'm running late today because I had some things I needed to do this morning, and so I had to put my program off till this afternoon. But I hope that you got something from this. I pray that you did. If you have a need for further help with a message, or these, any of the messages for that matter, contact me. Um, I'll give you my contact information. Our website, www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. My email on the website is Dr. Stephanie Dr. S-T-E-F-E-N-I at themasterstouch.org. Okay. Email me regular at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. You can reach me at poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net, or M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. That's M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. I want to invite you to to uh, join Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself every Monday on Spreaker.com at 10 a.m. for Living the Word. This is a program that teaches you how to apply the Word of God and the promises of God to your life today. So come, come join us on Mondays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com and come expecting to receive. Now my friends remember Proverbs 7, 4 verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting to get understanding. That's exactly what we're doing here. My dear ones, we are gaining God's wisdom, so be sure you're keeping Jesus Lord in your life. Now, the Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. <clears throat> I'll see you again here in the Master's Class on um, Monday. Okay? God bless you. <music>